To his friends, he was always Cairo Fred. But to the world, he was Omar Sharif, the exotic heartthrob who in the 1960s became the Rudolph Valentino of his day. The surname Sharif means noble in Arabic. And Omar always had about him an air of high-class sophistication. On screen, Hollywood producers tended to cast him in any role demanding an attractive foreigner. Off-screen, the media portrayed him as an international playboy who gambled in the world's top casinos and swept women off their feet in glamorous hotels. And as we shall see, at times he didn't do much to fight that image. His film career started in Egypt in the 1950s, and he may have stayed there had it not been for David Lean, the great British director cast Omar as Sheriff Ali in the 1962 classic Lawrence of Arabia. Here we join him looking back on that pivotal experience with Michael Parkinson. For Lawrence, we were out. It, the film, the shooting took a year and a half. And for about nine months, we were in the desert. The nearest road was 150 miles away. We were, on the te we were in, in tents, living in tents. And there were convoys of cistern trucks every day bringing water, you know, to, to, to give to the camels and the horses and the people. And, the, and, and to, they put showers on top of trucks. You know, they put things where you pulled on a string and lots of water fell on mm -hmm. you at the end of the day. And it was marvelous for me because it was my first film. I had not a lot of experience. And the fact that when the day's shooting was over, not all the actors went back to their homes, but all we could do was sit together and have a drink and chat out in the deserts. It meant that I could listen to all these marvelous actors, our Peter O'Toole and Alec Guinness and mm. uh, Claude Rains and, mm. and uh, Jack Hawkins. And they were talking about their work and about the theater and about their experiences. And I was like a sponge soaking it all up. Sharif, <laughs> 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 oh. I caught them. They had tracked us. They were here. I caught them. Why are you here? Boy. To serve Lord Orange, Sharif. This is true, Orange. They do wish it. You have been tracking us. You were told to stay. No, Sheriff. Our camel strayed. We followed her. She led us here to be Lord Oren's servants. It is the will of Allah. Blasphemy. Don't do that. No, no, Orens. These are not servants. These are outcasts, parentless. Be warned. They are not suitable. They sound very suitable. You can ride with the baggage. These are not servants. I these are worshippers. I imagine one of the problems out there must have been there, because I mean, it was all about sort of all sweeping desert landscapes and all that. It was, in fact, keeping it pristine, that, that desert landscape, while there's a thousand people milling around on it. Uh, it was, yes, well, it was terrible, because we had a team, actually, of 300 men whose job was to hold the broom, which, after every time we did a take on a shot, they had to go out and sweep all the tracks on the desert from, from the camera to the horizon. You know? Did you, when you were there for all that time, you said, do you ever feel that you're really sort of losing touch with the rest of the world? Yes, we did, as a matter of fact. When, while we were out there, this was in 1961 and 62, we, we got the newspapers from England and we, we were reading that there was a new thing that was very fashionable in all the nightclubs and discotheques, and that was the twist. And we said, what's that? And we read that everybody was doing the twist. <laughs> and Peter O'Toole and I said, God, we're going to go back to London, and we'd be ridiculous. We'd go to these discotheques, and we won't, be, we won't know how to dance. <laughs> so he said, I know what we'll do. We'll import a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so he arranged it with production. And out came a gorgeous blonde French girl. It would be a piece of two <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> And she stayed out. She brought this one record, which was a peppermint something. Peppermint twist. Yes. Yeah. She brought this one long playing. And we had this every, every evening after shooting. We get a bottle of whiskey out, have a couple of drinks, put the record on, and start going, you know, 
<laughs> with this girl. And then after about two, three weeks, this record started going like that. <laughs> we used so much of it. But when we got back to London, we were good. Lawrence Arabia didn't just introduce Omar to international audiences. It introduced him in the most spectacular way imaginable. The scene where Sheriff Ali and Lawrence first meet is one of cinema's greatest, although David Lean himself thought it might have been even better. Lawrence of Arabia, I don't know if you remember, I had a scene with uh, Omar. It turns out to be Omar Sharif coming out of a desert and he's a mirage and it starts as a sort of wavering shape. And uh, it ends up as this man who gets mm. on his camel. And I cut that at double the length at one time. And then I lost my nerve and I cut it in half and I made it all much quicker. Mm. And when the premiere came, I could have kicked myself because as it started, as that figure started wavering on the dist in the distance, the audience, you could have heard a pin drop, you know, yeah. and they were gripped. It was better the first time, but it did, did all right as it was. But you do make, you do learn things years afterwards. Did you not replace it after that and make it longer? No. Yeah. No, it's done. You've done it. That was Lean's strongest memory of the premiere. Omar was just relieved to be there at all after getting into trouble with Peter O'Toole the night before the big opening. What was it like when you first went to Hollywood? Because it must have been very alien. Well, my folks. first night I spent in jail with Peter O'Toole. Well, no did. one ever found out about it, thank God, because we would have never worked again. <laughs> really? Yes, we arrived. It was a dream. I mean, our dream all the time, all the hardships we had in the desert was over 100 degrees. And it was really, our dream was to arrive in Hollywood. We'd never been, either of us. And finally we made it there, the night before the opening of Lawrence. And the studio gave us a huge limousine in the evening and said, you can go out and have some fun. So we got onto this limousine and went down Sunset Strip. And we saw in a theater advertised Lenny Bruce, who was a terrific comedian. And we said, let's go and see him. So we went in there and watched the show. And then we went backstage, said, you were marvelous and all that. We loved you. And we introduced ourselves. You don't know us, but we are two actors. Tomorrow we have a, the opening of a film. Come and have a drink with us. He said, OK. So we went out, had a few. And at about 1 o'clock in the morning, he said, look, I've got to nip back home for about 15 minutes. Would you like to wait for me here, or would you like to come? We said, we'll come with you. So we went back, went to his place. And he, he got this needle and put it in his vein, oh. and he was, you know, mainline, whatever they call it. And all of a sudden, they broke the door down, and there came the police. And they hauled us all to the police station. And Peter O'Toole, being Irish, hates the cops anyway. <laughs> and he's very rude to them. They had a few drinks. Yeah, they hate them or become yeah, one. I don't know, <laughs> yes. And he was very rude to them, and they didn't take, they didn't, they didn't have much sense of humor, those ones there. <laughs> and uh, so they said, all right, you inside. And I tried to lock us up. And I was the most sober of the three. And I'd seen a lot of American films. I said, I have the right to make a phone call. <laughs> so, yes, so I picked up the phone and called the Beverly Hills Hotel where Sam Spiegel, the producer, was staying. And it was four in the morning, and I said to the, the, the operator, I said, give me Mr. Spiegel. She said, I can't disturb him at this. I said, please do, it's very urgent. Anyway, finally, I got him on the phone. He was half asleep. I mean, he was so much half asleep. That I said, he said, who is this? I said, it's Omar. He said, Omar who? I said, Sam, how many Omars do you know? <laughs> <laughs> said, oh, that Omar. Yeah. <laughs> said, I said, we're in jail. He said, who's in jail? I said, Peter O'Toole and I. He, uh, he said, where? I said, whatever, precinct or whatever. And he, so half an hour later, he walked in with lots of guys with hats and briefcases. <laughs> had a chat with the cops. And then they opened the thing and they said, right, you two can come out. But this time, Peter was very friendly with Lenny. 
<laughs> and he said, what about him? They said, no, he stays, because he had the record. He said, I'm not going anywhere without my friend. I said, yeah. he said, Sam said, don't be a child. He said, don't be a child yourself. I, you have to get my friend out. So they went back to the, had another chat. <laughs> <laughs> More money first hand, you know, you that was the first night in His performance in Lawrence earned Omar a Best Supporting Actor Golden Globe Award and an Oscar nomination. He won the Best Actor Golden Globe Award three years later for his performance in David Lean's next film, Dr. Zhivago, the epic tale of romance and revolution in which he played the title role. Now the the $64,000 question, of course, was who played Zhivago. Now, Zhivago is a very passive part, and uh, I think it'd be, uh, he's a poet and a doctor, but the fatal pitfall, I think, would have been to cast too much with the type. If I'd had a very studious young man, uh, I think he'd tend to be a bore in the picture, and so I thought I will go for immense good looks and I thought of Omar because he'd played the sheikh in Lawrence who came out of the Mirage and uh, he's a very sensitive actor and uh, we happen to work very well together it, it uh, he catches on and uh, I think I think it works and I thought I could get this Russian poet out of him and I backed that hunch. A lot of people thought I was mad, but I don't think I was. I think you'd make great success in this film. Omar would claim that he was cast in two David Lean films because he was one of the few actors that the director actually liked. Was the feeling mutual? This interview would suggest not. He's a man who's very easy to hate. In other words, it is very easy to hate David and very difficult to like him. He is a very hard man a very selfish man who has no pity for anyone and none for himself either, which is, which is a very rare thing. He has no self-pity and uh, no self-indulgence. And therefore, it is very, easy, uh, very difficult for him to pity anybody else or to feel sorry for anybody, however tired they may be. He considers everybody on the set, everybody who's helping to make the film, as objects rather than as people. They are the things that are making his film. And, well, you can see how easy it is uh, if you think that he's considering you as an object, how easy it is to be terribly unhappy and rather hate him for it. I know that I have, at the end of many days shooting, felt terrible hate for him. And I know, for instance, most of the people who have worked with him and who work with him rather dislike him because he drives them too hard and he uses them too much. Dr. Zhivago was not initially liked by the critics, but it was a huge financial hit and is now considered amongst Lean's finest work. And Omar played a key part in one of the scenes which Lean took most pride in. I was very frightened of a scene we had in which a whole group of dragoons charge a pr procession. I was frightened of it because I've seen so many horsemen charging people and the sword comes, swords come out. You have close-ups of the sword being lifted and a close-up of a man with his head being split open, falling down the street, and it's bong, 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 and it's a kind of bore. And I got the idea of not showing any of it at all. So what I did was this. I had the um, dragoons charge down the street the people start to run. Little incidentals of the running, such as a drum rolling down the street. And then at the moment that the clash came, I cut to a big close-up of Omar Sharif, and I stayed on him, hearing the yells and the cries off stage. I held it for quite a long time and then cut back to the street and there were the bodies lying there. Thank goodness it, I think, worked. But uh, if it hadn't worked, I'd have been cooked because I didn't shoot any of that sabre bashing. With Lawrence and Zhivaga under his belt, Omar should have had the world at his feet. 
and said he had the Arab world up in arms. At the same time as the Israeli-Egyptian Six-Day War, publicity photos of him kissing his co-star, Barbara Streisand, were released ahead of the 1968 film Funny Girl. Streisand's Jewish background prompted calls in Egypt for Omar's citizenship to be removed. And back in Hollywood, many of the film's Jewish backers wanted him replaced. In the end, he stayed and even had an affair with Streisand that lasted for the duration of the film's production. The 1960s also saw another film with Peter O'Toole, The Night of the Generals, and then in 1969 came Che, in which he played Cuba's revolutionary leader, Che Guevara. Is it difficult creating a role uh, of a man who so recently died, a man who uh, has, a, has a fantastic reputation anyway? Do you find this hard? Well, I find it uh, frightening, and um, I think it's a great responsibility. But I'm fortunate enough, first of all, to look quite a bit like him, like he did, which makes it a lot easier. Because once you look like someone, it, it's much easier to be him yeah. than uh, if you have to work very hard already at looking and, and, and uh, never succeed at looking like the person you're playing. <laughs> From some accounts of him, he wasn't <coughs> a very warm or sympathetic person, that he was so concerned with revolution and with politics. Is this an aspect of Che that you're putting across? Yes, he was... Uh, he, you, you didn't see very easily who he liked and who he didn't like, but... Um, he didn't let his hair down, in other words, very often. It was sort of difficult to approach, difficult to get to. And that's why um, he had such a fascinating personality, because people who are like that um, attract people to them. Mystery? Yes. Did you finally come to admire him yourself? Yes, but I, uh, I would admire anyone I, you know, I portrayed. I find it very difficult to dislike someone that I play. Do you know what I mean? I always give him a justification, even if he's doing something wrong. Despite Omar's good intentions, Che was a disaster. One critic at the time called it one of the 50 worst films ever made. And its reception seemed to coincide with Omar falling out of love with acting. I was lucky enough to appear with him in one of his best received films of the period, 1974's The Tamarind Seed. Oh, he was so charming and so nice. But increasingly, he was becoming known for his other passions, gambling and the card game Bridge, at which he was ranked among the best players in the world. Is playing Bridge more important to you than filming? Well, it's, it's, um, it's not more important to me, but it gives me much more pleasure I mean, obviously, filming is very important to me because it's, it's what enables me to be able to have hobbies, uh, to, to play bridge, to make bridge known, because I use, actually, what I gain in my career to do that. And my career is very important to me. But as you get older, as it were, you, you look f um, after your pleasure much more than you do when you're younger. And what I'm doing now is bridge is what gives me real pleasure and I'd rather be playing bridge than filming that's quite true but that's obvious one always prefers to indulge in one's hobby rather than to indulge in one's work of course as well as bridge playing there was always the Casanova image to play up to which Omar did with varying degrees of enthusiasm in television appearances like this one from 1977 here in the company of Miss France, Miss Austria, Miss Las Vegas, Miss Monte Carlo, and Miss Nice, please give a big welcome to Omar Sharif. It's colder than the desert. Seriously, Omar, I have never met a film star who has managed to separate himself so completely and so successfully from all the ballyhoo that surrounds the film industry. You seem almost to exist on a separate level. Yes, fortunately, I have, I have passions that, uh, 
that allow me to do that. I've heard. But, I mean, up to the, up to, <laughs> <laughs> not those ones. <laughs> no, up to about five years ago, I was working all the time and traveling and living in hotels out of suitcases and all. And I felt that I didn't have any private life and that I've so, sort of messed up or missed up on my life and uh, didn't have a family, neighbors, a club that you go to, uh, regular habits. I made friends with people for about two months during the shooting of a film and then I had to go and never saw them again. So I woke up one day and I thought, well, what have I done? Nothing. It's all right to have ambition and to want to make your career and all when you're young, but after you pass the age of 40, you want to have something to show for all your, the work you've done and something to look forward to when you get older. Well, you certainly make a point of enjoying yourself. I mean, you've immersed yourself in, well, horse racing is one of your big passions, of course. I love the horse. I love animals. And I think that the horse is probably, in my opinion, the most beautiful animal. It's a very proud animal. And it's gorgeous to look at, the way it moves, the way it... And I've taken up uh, breeding of horses. And the breathing is very exciting because you feel in a way like a creator because you choose who's going to be dad and who's going to be mom and you marry them as it were and then if you succeed one day in having a, a little foal that's going to be a great horse maybe in 300 years from now i will look into pedigree books and see that not I will. <laughs> Someone will. <laughs> the world will see the name of a horse that I bred. And this is the only way I can go to posterity. The interviews were now all about Omar, the man about town, not about the films he continued to churn out regularly, which were, in his own words, mostly rubbish, but also done for the paychecks. There was a sense of what might have been about him. In the 1980s, he tried to rekindle the love for acting, not on screen, but on stage, in Terence Rattigan's The Prince and the Showgirl. He discussed the play and, of course, his sex symbol status in this appearance on The Wogan Show. He said, you've seduced three girls in three different languages <laughs> on three separate nights. Are you denying all knowledge of this? Yes, well, I'm, I'm, not, <laughs> no, I'm not denying the fact that I talked to three different girls. We were in India, mind you. There was not much to do there. How does the image, that heartthrob image, which is middle, how does it match up with the real person that's... Well, um, I, I, you, everybody knows I've got these extraordinary passions for racing horses, for bridge, for cards, and uh, for good food and wine. And these are passions that don't go too well with a passion for girls because when you play bridge or go racing, you don't really want to have a, a girlfriend with you because it sort of it doesn't help your concentration on what you're doing. When you said that you're a passionate man and you listed your passions, I, I don't remember you mentioning acting. Well, yes, that is my first and basic passion, but what has happened was in the last few years, perhaps I did too much of uh, films, and in the last few years, I find that I, the parts have not been interesting. The parts that I have been offered and parts I have even worked on have not been interesting. They have not challenged me in any way. They were all too much on the nose, and I, I remember my passion for acting with with a, a lo it, it was very important to me, and I want that to happen again. I want to have that enthusiasm again, and I think that the theater will give me that. Do you involve yourself in, in what has been called the method style? Do you, do you oh, get I, deeply involved in the motivation? No, I, I don't like very much that. I don't, I don't particularly like, and perhaps I'm wrong. I'm not saying that I'm right in what I like or not, but I don't like method actors in general because I find them so very boring and tiresome to work with. I don't, I'm not speaking of the results of what they do. Mo a lot of them are brilliant, but uh, I find them very tiresome to work with. They're always going behind the sets and working themselves up into a, some tremendous 
frantic state and coming back when they're all worked up and you don't know what it's about, you know, and all they have to say is good morning and they say, I can't think why, but, but it looks terrific on the screen. I just, I've, I've never seen any English actors do that. I mean, uh, I've worked with a lot of British actors and I've never seen any actors go running around behind the set and getting worked up. I mean, I knew one actor, one American actor, he had to run about a mile before saying anything at all, because he liked to be out of breath. <laughs> you sure he wasn't doing that to sober up? <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't a particular drunk, that, that one. But do you ever see yourself in a part and think, I wish I'd worked myself up a bit more for that? Yes, very often. I find I'm half asleep most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> I actually need to run around a bit, but I can't do it. I can't be bothered. He may not have been bothered most of the time, but Omar could still win acclaim when he tried. In 2003, he won Francis César Award for Best Actor, for his part in the film, Monsieur Ibrahim. It would be his last performance of note, and he was 71. An age that at one stage he had looked forward to. How do you regard, for example, the prospect of growing old? Well, I love the idea of growing old. I, I think old people have an admirable life. I always envied the life that old people have. The only fear I possibly have about getting old is being ill or not well. But if I knew that I was not going to be ill and not well, then I would love to be old. Because it's got so many advantages. First of all, all the women problem is gone. Which is, <laughs> no, it's very good. You don't have that problem anymore. So that's one thing that's settled. The other thing is that I think they have marvelous lives, all regulated with wonderful little habits and you get up at exactly 7.37 and you go in the kitchen and make your cup of tea yourself and then you go out and get your newspaper and sit and walk in the park and sit on that bench exactly for 56 minutes. It's, I mean, I think it's a marvelous life that they have. They don't have any problems really. And even in their relationship, uh, a couple, say an old couple, is the most beautiful and charming thing that you can see because it's real love. It's got none of the um, tension and fear that you have in, the, in young people's love because you're always afraid to lose the girl you love and she's afraid to lose you. When you're old, you're not really afraid to lose each other. It's relaxed and it's mild. Sadly, Omar's final years were troubled with illness and Alzheimer's disease and he died of a heart attack in July 2015, aged 83. Despite those years when film success proved elusive, the tributes were affectionate and agreed that those early performances in Lawrence of Arabia and Dr. Zhivago meant he deserved his place in cinema history. Not only as the Arab world's first international movie star, but also as the actor who was introduced to audiences with what is Arguably, the finest entrance ever seen in film.